Okay, uh, here we go. So what I'm going to, oh, sorry. So what I'm going to talk about today is I decided not to talk about the vineyards again. Two weeks in a row might have been a little heavy uh, for not only me, but for you guys as well. So um, I've decided to, I'll delay that one and I'll talk about learnings from the vineyard next week about uh, issues that have been going on in the vineyards through lack of water, through climatic change, heat, uh, etc. So we'll talk about that next week. So this week I'm going to talk about white wine style. This is the first time I'm actually going to use some of our own wines as a reference. So I hope you don't mind. Um, I haven't actually talked too much about our own brands uh, in the first uh, three meetings. So I'm going to discuss Marlborough. Uh, obviously we've just finished the harvest down there and what we do stylistically that's a little bit unique. Uh, touch on winemaking and then spend probably 60% of this discussion talking about Chardonnay and clones and malolactic. Uh, some of you have seen me talk a little bit about the clones previously, so it might be a little bit rep repetitious, but I am going to talk more about the style. Uh, this is a project that's been going, some of you may have seen this photo, so this is a project that's been going on around Healdsburg with, um, uh, they're using this for the museum, they're running around and taking photos of uh, families stuck at home, so this is this is our bubble. Uh, we have two of our children at home, three, the other three are not. I've been painting um, rooms. That's what I've been doing and drinking at the same time. So sometimes that doesn't work out too well. Uh, Hillary is an eighth grader. And so she is holding her prom dress. There won't be any prom this year. There's no graduation this year. And I'm sure that many of you are going through that same cycle as well. And Royce, who's the twin of Kate, uh, you can see he needs a haircut. He's been in his cave a long time playing computer games, but he's also online studying. And of course, he only works constantly from home. Uh, the first thing I want to do is talk about New Zealand. And this is when I think about my home country, this is what I think about. This is a view, believe it or not, from where I was born. Um, this is from Mangafai. So Mangafai is a surf beach. These are the hen and chicken islands. And that's Sail Rock. Uh, of course, New Zealand is known for sailing. And that's the home of the America's Cup. If you want to come back and get your America's Cup, you're going to have to come to New Zealand to get it. Uh, that, uh, and obviously when I worked for Louis Vuitton, I was very lucky to travel uh, around with the sailing teams, uh, part of Louis Vuitton. This is a new boat. That's going to be the new America's boat. It's a 75 meter. So you can imagine how long this thing is. Uh, times by three will give you in feet. And so this is this has taken foiling to a whole new level. I am a sailor, for those who don't know. Um, uh, so this thing is actually only going to be on two spires. This is a mono hull rather than a cat. So the last America's Cups were raced by catamarans, you know, two hulls. This is going to be a single hull. Um, I don't know if you are much into sailing, but the entry fee is 50 million. Uh, so this is a big boy sport. Uh, as a kid, I played rugby and this is a team called the Invincibles. So this was the first team to go to, doesn't mean much to you guys in terms of rugby. This is a real man sport as well. We don't wear pads. Um, but the Invincibles were in the 18, 1870s, 1880s. They actually traveled to England and all had to get jobs. This is before the professional sport and they played there for two years. And they were the first team to ever beat England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland and France all on one tour. And so it was fairly significant. And the other thing that we do is obviously we ski. Uh, that's a picture of me and my youth skiing. <laughs> um, but I put this photo up too because you guys don't know how to ski, man. This is called a T-bar. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have skied on T-bars, but this T here, you pull down and it pulls two of you up the field. We don't have no goddamn chairlifts, man. We, we're tough. We're tough in New Zealand. So uh, that's the way we ski. And of course, my girlfriends, plenty of girlfriends. So let's have a quick look at New Zealand. Uh, I'm from Mangafai, as I said, so I'm up from, uh, this is Auckland, the biggest city in New Zealand. Uh, I'm from Mangafai, which is up here. It takes me about three hours, or it used to take three hours to get up to Mangafai. Our vineyards that we work on are in Marlborough, and then we do a little bit down in central Otago. The, uh, the plane flight from here to, from Auckland to Blenheim, Blenheim is the capital of Marlborough, is uh, one of the scariest flights in the world. I don't know if many of you have done it, but you fly um, super high because this, the wind pattern between the North and the South Island is extremely strong. 
and uh, it's extremely bumpy. And so the pilots always fly really high and we fly these planes called needles. And so you, you can't actually sit straight in the chair, you have to lean over because the plane comes over the top of your head. And um, they fly super high and then as soon as they hit land, as soon as they hit the Marlborough Sounds, the, uh, the plane goes straight down. And you can always tell people that haven't done that flight before because they tend to hang on and scream a little bit. So it's rather an exciting flight. The second most interesting flight is the flight over the Andes between Santiago and Mendoza because of the vacuum that's formed on Argentina. I don't know if you, many of you guys have done that either. Uh, looking at Marlborough, there's actually three, I guess um, we call them, uh, we don't call them counties, we call them um, boroughs, but the same sort of thing. So Marlborough's made is a very big area. It's made up of three uh, river valleys. So to the south, we have Ward. We don't really care about Ward because it's extremely dry. We have the Awatere uh, River that flows into Clifford Bay, and we have the Wairau River that flows into Cloudy Bay. The other significant factors are the Richmond Range, which is here to the north, and the Wither Hills here to the south. So the winds are blocked uh, from the Richmond Range, and the rain is blocked um, from the, from the, by the Wither Hills on the southern range as well. The other place that we get cooling effect is actually from the Alps. So um, the Alps of New Zealand run all the way down here. And believe it or not, these Alps are bigger than Switzerland and Austria put together. So that's how big they are. And they're quite significant in terms of the formation of the land. Looking at where our vineyards are, <coughs> there's um, four roads. There's four roads in Marlborough. There's uh, New Renwick, sorry, New Renwick Road, Middle Renwick Road, Old Renwick Road, and Rapara Road. So there's only four roads. They all run east-west. A whole bunch of roads run north-south. And uh, Fitzroy, which is where we make Boulder Bank from, this is what they call the Golden Mile. It's pretty interesting that the, the word Golden Mile is now being used in a number of countries. I work in the Golden Mile in the Okanagan. There's a Golden Mile now in Maipo and Chile as well. But this road here is very significant. This is called Jackson's Road. It's a very famous road because um, this is where Cloudy Bay, Alan Scott, Paratai, which is Martua's top wine, Stonely, and then us. And then uh, the big champagne house is right here as well. Where we make the forefathers, which is the wax eyes up on the Hawkesbury River. So it's a different uh, soil up there. These are the labels that you've seen before. Uh, the flax, <clears throat> the reason why I talked about Mungafai is because I'm from the north and the flax that we have on the label uh, flax is the native dress of the Maori, and I don't know if you know this, but in New Zealand, everyone at school now has to speak Maori. Half the television stations are in Maori. The courts are all in Maori. You have to translate to be in English. They're really promoting, and this has been going on for some time, for about 15, 20 years now, where our um, native race is becoming politically extremely strong. So if a New Zealander looks at this, they will know that the flax comes from the north because it's very thin up there and the stones are from the, uh, from the vineyard. Fitzroy is the name of my uncle. And this is the significant thing in New Zealand. It's the, we were the first country to do um, a register sustainable farming. If you want to know what that means, it's an 80 page document on the New Zealand wineries website. You can go to and read, but it's also a uh, second country in the world that's doing it right now is Chile. And the third place in the world, believe it or not, is Sonoma County. Napa County has not done it yet. Right now, Sonoma County is about 85% registered sustainable vineyards, of which we are one, and we hope by 2021 that we'll be at 100%. The other wine that we make is called Forefathers. Uh, this is a pair of boots that I used to wear when I walked around Simi. This is my constitution that I wrote about um, family farmers, because that's basically what I am. And John Hancock's signature which I stole and changed to my own. <laughs> and uh, wax eye is the name of the bird that eats all the grapes. But forefathers, we came up with this name uh, because one day I was on a plane down to Cloudy Bay when I was working for Louis Vuitton. Why am I going to Cloudy Bay to make Cabernet Chardonnay, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling and everything else? I mean, when you think Mulberry, you only think Sauvignon Blanc. So we made a forefather Sauvignon Blanc uh, from New Zealand, Marlborough, uh, McLaren Vale, Shiraz, Uko Valley, Malbec, and Cabernet from California, which we still make. This is a picture of my father and my son uh, working in the vineyard. Again, the sustainability symbol. So Forefathers was the first multi-country brand that I knew about. This is before Layer Cake, Cupcake, and all the other bloody cakes that came along and screwed it up. But um, 
this is, I uh, hope none of those people are on the line, uh, but uh, Forefathers is different because it is, it is a single vineyard. So these are the wax eyes for those that have seen the game Angry Birds. This is where the game Angry Birds came from. They look really cute, but they fly in a flock of four or 5,000 and they eat nothing but grapes and they feed for 30 miles. So what we do is we go outside, you take a shotgun. If you don't kill at least seven, it was a bad shot. Can't do that in California. <laughs> Um, so April 4th, we, we picked our Boulder Bank vineyard. Those are the, uh, that's the Richmond range. Uh, there behind me would be um, the Wither Hills and everything is machine harvested. You can see how green the grass is, even at time of harvest. So how much rainfall, that's really unique about um, controlling humidity and rainfall in New Zealand. And so building up this organic matter is really important. And there's a big lesson here that I think the Australians did not adhere to, and nor do we do it in California. And that's why I've been really um, pushing my growers to keep permanent cover, because not only does it build up organic matter, but it also allows for water penetration. When you go out and disc, which is what the Germans used to do in the Barossa Valley, when you go out and disc after a rainfall, that's great. But eventually what happens is the winds will actually remove a lot of the topsoil. And so you'll find that there's a lack of organic matter, in it, and especially in the Barossa Valley. Uh, we machine harvest, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then uh, the other key things for me are the growing degree days. I know it doesn't mean a lot to um, a lot of you out in the sales arena, but as a winemaker, it's fairly important. This is a, um, a way that we measure uh, the number of degrees above 10 Celsius for the four months during harvest. So Marlborough, we have about a thousand growing degree days. Loire is about 1900, Sonoma County is 1300 and Napa is 1600. And it gives you an idea of what you're talking about. So even though you may be at the same latitude, the temperature difference or the, or the position of the sun is, um, has, a, has a big influence as well. So, uh, so that's, you know, people try to try to say, all right, you know, our latitude is the same, but the soils are completely different. The wind is completely different and uh, et cetera. So other places that I work, so Marlborough latitude is 41 degrees south. Um, so just to compare that, Napa Valley is at 38 degrees north. So even though you think 38 to 41 is not that big a difference, remember, we're talking about the size of the earth here. So it's a long way. Okanagan, where I work, which is in British Columbia, up on Lake, Lake Okanagan, is at 49 degrees. And our vineyard in, Mol in uh, southern Chile is actually at 38 degrees. So we talk about uh, Chile, try again, where our vineyard is, and is in Moyeco, so that's south of Itata and Bio Bio. So when you think about that being a long way south in Chile, it's uh, not as far south as we are in Marlborough. The other thing is that the temperature during harvest in Marlborough is usually relatively cool. We have a dramatic fall off um, in temperature as we get closer to harvest, and that's often what drives our pick dates. Uh, just one thing to remember that Marlborough is about 80% Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough from start to finish is about 10 to 12 days. That's a hell of a big job to get a to get uh, 30,000 tons off in 10 to 12 days. You cannot do it by hand. It's just not possible. As far as the soils, we're in the Golden Mile with Fitzroyal, so it's, it's loam over the river gravels, whereas in wax we're in the glacial soils. <coughs> this is a look at the growing degree days. So we're in the yellow zone here uh, with Fitzroy and with um, uh, Boulder Bank, uh, sorry, and, and uh, wax we're also in this, this thousand, uh, our zone as well. The town of Blenheim and Dashwood, which is over in the Aotearoa, you can see are a lot warmer. But as we hit the Southern Vales, the glacial soils, and over in the Jacksons, uh, Richmond Range, obviously we've got cooler as well. People are starting to plant down here, and people are starting to plant up here, which is, this is uh, really marginal. There's a lot of frost, etc. So moving into these uh, zones is gonna be trouble. If we look at the same thing in California, same growing degree day map in California, you can see that uh, Napa Valley is this green area, so 1600 growing degree days. And then over here in Sonoma County, in the Alexander Valley, we are Sonoma County, Russian River, of course, we're at the 1300 growing degree days. 
Does that kind of make sense? Sort of bring it back to reality a bit for you guys. Uh, looking at the soils in Marlborough, this again, the Wairau River, uh, there's the Wairau Valley. These are the glacier, the, uh, sorry, these are the river soils, these yellow soils. These are the glacial soils. So what happened was these are the Wither Hills. The glaciers came off the Wither Hills many years ago and formed these what we call river valleys or what we call the Southern Vales now. So uh, where the Waxai vineyard is it up on here. There's a third area here called Dillon's Point. We used to work in here. The soil here is a little bit different because this is like um, the equivalent soils would be like Carneros, you know, where it was lifted up out of the ocean. So Dillon's Point was lifted up out of the ocean too. So the Carneros, I don't know if you know, Carneros was lifted up out of the ocean, uh, which is part of the St. Helena lift. And that's what blocked the Russian River off because the Russian River used to form the Napa Valley. It used to flow into San Francisco Bay. But when we had the earthquake that um, when uh, Mount St. Helena was lifted up, it blocked off the Russian River. And that's why the Russian River now flows into the Pacific Ocean through Jenner rather than in the San Francisco Bay. Here we are at the Fitzroy Vineyard, just driving down the uh, road. This is the way we do it in New Zealand. We make our roads just wide enough for our rental cars to fit down. You can see we're not quite ready yet. A little bit of time to go. We've still got the waxy outside to the Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, so we're close to Verizon, but not yet. Anyway, another gorgeous day in Marlborough driving down the rows. Fitzroy Vineyard, 2018. I think that's pretty funny. I put that up there. Well, it's my sense of humor because uh, we learned that when we worked with Brancott and Stonely because these guys, every 10th row, they'd put an extra wide row and so they'd get their rental cars down or their trucks. So, <laughs> saves getting out, man. G'day, I'm Nick Goldschmidt. I'm the winemaker for Forefather Sauvignon Blanc here in the Marlborough region in New Zealand. And we're standing out here prior to the 2018 vintage. And what's unique about this vineyard is we have much more water holder capacity here than a lot of other vineyards in Marlborough. We don't have a lot of stone, we have more soil, which means that we don't get as much dehydration, we don't have to irrigate as much, and hence we have a much darker, greener canopy. That also means we can push the, the ripeness a little bit further so we get more texture, more weight, more flesh, which is much more interesting for the US palate. A little fuller and richer, so the wine comes in the mouth kind of like this and has this textural element. Not too green, not too grassy, but a little bit more passion fruit. Today we're out here, we're, um, we're still about 10 days to two weeks away from Verazon. The berries are still pretty solid and uh, we've got a little way to go yet. And we expect to be harvesting here in about two months, probably. But anyway, it looks like a great vintage. We've got beautiful blue skies. We're out here in beautiful Marlborough. Anyway, 2018, Forefathers Sauvignon Blanc, Waxi Vineyard. So, going through the keys in, uh, when making wine in, in Marlborough, the machine harvesting, as I alluded to, is very important because of the, the amount of grape we've got to get off. The other thing that we do is, um, key thing for me is this juice lees contact. So if I've got the tank space, I'll do it. So when you press grapes, you can imagine the screens, uh, through those screens, we get little bits of skin and pulp. And what we do is we leave it on that juice lees for up to 10 days cold. The reason I do that is because we only sell these wines in the US. And the American palate, the Americans want to have a little bit more richness. They don't like the steely uh, Sauvignon Blanc that you get that the British like to drink. So the British like to drink really uh, fresher, more acidic, but obviously we eat Mediterranean food in the US, so we wanna have something a little bit more fleshy. So the juice leaves contact is really important. Uh, the stainless steel is important as well because it allows us to, col to control the speed of the ferment. Uh, just breaking off for a second, there's the thiol. So when you talk to winemakers, they talk about thiols. Thiols are the green characters, okay? Now, if you want a lot of thiol, you can ferment warmer. If you don't want the thiol, you ferment colder. Now, selling in the US, we don't want too much thiol because Americans don't seem to like the asparagus cut grass character or the, cit the, the grapefruit character. So I ferment most of our Sauvignon Blanc cold so that we avoid that character. Uh, you've heard about wine lees contact as well. Obviously, you do that with Chardonnay. It's mainly for antioxidation and adding texture. 
and then reductive versus oxidative winemaking. I'm not going to go into details today, but basically we use a reductive form of winemaking for Sauvignon Blanc and an oxidative form of winemaking for the Chardonnay. And yeah, we use screw cap. It captures it, baby. It captures all the uh, varietal character. Okay, the advantages of machine harvesting, we can pick cold, we can pick fast. If we know that there's adverse conditions coming up, and the growers don't actually do the picking like we do here in California. The wineries do the picking. So the wineries have machines, they send them to the vineyard, they pick, they go into the next vineyard, the next vineyard, the next vineyard. And the reason why they do that is because if there's a breakdown of the winery, they can shut the uh, machines off in the vineyard. In California, they just keep picking and the trucks just back up. I'm sure that when you come to California, you send trucks down the road outside wineries and that's why. Uh, the speed of the grapes is important. They're not sitting in the heat. Is real fast loading of the trucks. You saw a photo of that. And believe it or not, I think that the technology has come so far that we're actually getting better harvest, cleaner harvest without the stems, without the rakers, uh, by using the machines. And we get less damage these days as well. It also gives us, uh, we can really control the skin contact and the pieces of the, of the grape contact so it's an old technique, but we're reusing it now because we can control the temperature. So we cold machine harvest. I thought it was funny because everything we do is cold, right? Machine harvest in the cold, we skin contact cold, we juice leaves cold for 10 days, we cold ferment, we give cold leaves contact, and we hopefully you guys serve it cold as well. So the whole thing is cold. I don't know, makes it simple. Uh, when comparing the two wines, the most, and I'm gonna do this a little bit later on when we talk about Chardonnay, but Basically, the Forefathers is a little bit more tropical, a little bit more passion fruit uh, than uh, the Boulder Bank. We've moved, uh, this was a sh sheet that I put up last, uh, two years ago. So we're gradually moving away from this end of the spectrum and making it more sort of melon character moving up. And I'll, again, I'll show that what that means in the, in, the, in the meantime. If you want to have a crisper mouth though, Boulder Bank is still your choice. If you want a little fleshier and fuller, if you're eating sushi or something like that, I'd be wanting to drink um, uh, the forefathers. And the way I do that is I trick the palate. So not to bore you guys too much, but normally uh, I have to talk metric. Sauvignon Blanc is normally bottled at about 1,400, uh, sorry, 1,000 a, a milligram per liter of CO2, okay? When you bottle with CO2, it tricks the mouth. You think it's acid, but it's not. So when you put that wine in your mouth, you go, like shit, am I hungry, am I thirsty? And that's the sensation I try to get. So without Sauvignon Blanc, with Boulder Bank, it's not a city to that you're tasting, it's a little bit of CO2. So instead of being a thousand milligram per liter, I'm about 1200 milligram per liter. Chardonnay is normally about seven, six, 700, Cabernet is usually about 200, just so as a point of reference. So right now we're selling the, uh, the Russian River single vineyard, uh, it's the 2018. And the Dutton, which you may or may not have seen, which is the reserve wine, that's 1700, uh, the 2017. This is a photo. This is a, um, a picture of what the uh, the Dutton looks like. And we've also we've also launched um, another wine called Fox Edge, which is kind of a specialty wine for people who want to avoid selling uh, singing tree because, of course, the regular singing tree is in a lot of um, uh, uh, supermarkets, etc. So going into Chardonnay. These are the singing trees at our house. They are full of small birds and they are incredibly loud. I don't know if you can hear that very well, but the um, the sound of those birds in November and December is absolutely crazy, man. It's like, uh, and then right now, of course, it's the frogs. Man, there are so many frogs at our house right now. The frogs and the coyotes. I think the coyotes are eating the frogs. I don't know what's going on, but man, it's a bloody. Uh, we always say that the dogs howling in Chile because there's a lot of homeless dogs. We call that the America, the uh, Chilean opera. It's like what's going on right now in California with the frogs. It's like the the Sonoma opera is frogs, 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 frogs. Anyway, so um, the reserve Chardonnay that we make is, is from Dutton, and here's the Fog's Edge label. And uh, obviously Fog, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So what I wanted to talk about mainly today was uh, the influences on the vineyard uh, that we look at for Chardonnay, obviously cool climate, the soil, the mass selections, 
uh, that some of you have heard me talk about before, but how that relates to style and the age of the vineyard. And then on the wine side, the only thing I'll say is on the reduction is that we don't add any nutrients. So normally with yeast, once yeast start fermenting, they need nitrogen. And if you don't add the nitrogen, the yeast go into more stress. And so that's what I like to do. And then I'll talk briefly about limiting the amount of malolactic that we do. The Russian River Valley is not like the Alexander Valley or the Napa Valley because it's a little bit complicated, but the, 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 the Russian River is formed in the north. We have one gap and in the south we have another gap and that's where the fog comes in and the fog comes in in the evenings. So the gaps are the Skag Springs, which is uh, just basically to the west of us here. And then the Petaluma Gap, which is down near uh, Sebastopol. So in the evenings, if you've been at my house, you'll know that it gets really windy and that's the fog that comes in. And when we wake up in the morning, that fog is sitting all through the Russian River. Some of it goes up into the Alexander Valley, uh, obviously, because there's a gap right here near Fitch Mountain and, and uh, we'll get fog on the plains in the Alexander Valley, again at night. Meantime, in Napa Valley, this is not the case. The fog that you see in the Napa Valley comes in the morning. When the sun comes up, it shines on Mount St. Lena and drags the fog up off Frisco Bay. So the fog that you get in Napa Valley comes directly from San Francisco Bay. The fog that you get in the Russian River and the Alexander Valley comes from the ocean itself. So completely different. And uh, so that's why we are on the vine for about 15 to 20% longer uh, than Napa Valley in Sonoma County. In Singing Tree, both wines are to the south, so we've cooled from the Petaluma Gap, and Dutton is also uh, cooled from the Petaluma Gap. But the Dutton ranch that we work with, there's three big Dutton ranches. The one that we work with is the coldest one. It's down on uh, Poplar Road, which is um, in the Green Valley, which is the coldest sub-appellation of the Russian River. So there's three soil types. Um, in Marlborough, we had three soil types, and here we have three soil types. The best one is the Goldridge because this is the one I expound upon all the time because this is the one that doesn't have any organic matter. And it's basically sandstone that's been broken down into loam soil and that's what we call the Goldridge series. We like this because of course there's no organic matter for the phylloxera to live in. Uh, then we have the Sebastopol soil which is a little bit more clay based and then we have the Benchland soils which is, some people call it the Wachika, uh, which is predominantly alluvial. We want to stay away from this because it's a little bit too vigorous. All right, just looking at the evolution, I want to talk about mass selections versus clones. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but then I want to expand that into how this relates to style. So pre-prohibition, the Italians which who uh, came here and wanted to live their lifestyle, planted whatever they wanted to do, you know, Zinfandel with Carignan, Mavedra, and so. Um, so all the varietals petite were all planted together in one vineyard and these were basically field blends and they would pick everything together. After Prohibition in 30, 1933, we started seeing some wines get labelled and I've mentioned earlier that I still have a bottle of Simi 34 Cab, but BV and Inglenook were really the ones that took charge. They were the ones, they were the first, there was five original wineries in Napa Valley and five originals actually in Sonoma County. They talk about the 10 wineries. And those were the guys that were leading the varietal charge. After um, around about 1960, everybody was planting. Instead of mixed vineyards, they started planting by variety. And then there was this huge understanding, especially with Chardonnay. Chardonnay was the most understood variety because it had the most influence with these mass selections. Some people may call them field selections. Other people may call them masal. If you're in uh, Chile or Argentina, they talk about masal. It's all the same. And then in 1988-89, we had the huge change because, of course, we had phylloxera, and that's what basically changed. So I'm just going to come off uh, sharing here. I'm going to I'm going to unplug for a second. Is there any questions? What do you call an Australian with two girlfriends? A shepherd. Come on, guys. Nothing. You're all dead out there. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks, Ted. All right, so I'm just going to talk about uh, the evolution of Chardonnay, and then I'm going to go into the style. So I'm just going to do, uh, I'm not going to bore you with hundreds of graphs today. I'm just going to do uh, two or three. So I'm burning through paper, man. I'm on my third, I'm on my third one. 
third, third flip chart. <laughs> All right, so um, some of you guys may have seen this a little bit. I'm just going to uh, talk about, firstly, I'm going to describe how the mass selections came around. Uh, let's see if I can do speak of you. No, all I get is Ted. You're going to have to go on gallery view. So if you put on speak of you, you'll be able to see this a bit clearer. All right, so uh, what happened was we had these, um, the first thing to understand is we never had, back in the um, 70s and 80s, we didn't have nurseries, okay? We had to grow the plants ourselves. And it was quite easy to do because, and we didn't know why it was easy to do. Now we know why it was easy to do because there's two, there's two forms of vinifera. There's vitis vinifera and vitis labrasca. Okay, vitis vinifera is what you know, cab shard, malo, savvy reasoning. Vitis vinifera, uh, vitis labrasca is rapestris, blandieri, and some of these other things that are resistant to phylloxera. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the rootstock that we used at the time, there was two. One was called um, AXR1, which you'll recall, and the other one was called 1202. And this is the uh, rootstock. And what we put on top was the sign. Okay, the sign is Cab Shard Malo. It's crazy that they started calling a car a sign. I wonder if they really knew what they were talking about. Um, when we would take this rootstock, when the rootstock was growing, we just take it, we make a little T in the rootstock. Uh, we cut through the bark, we peel the bark back and exposes the cambium layer, that little, you want to go through the green layer into the, into the white layer. You can do this at home. I used to do it as a kid. I used to put apples on the pear tree, oranges on the mandarin tree, peaches on the uh, nectarine tree. My mum would come in and go, Christ, what's going on out there? I'm going, oh, it's cool. I know you guys, you, you, you Americans had already invented television, so you're already inside, but we're outside. This is what we were doing for our form of entertainment. So we would also, so then we would take Chardonnay and in the winter, we would take a stick and we have three buds on it and we put it in a cool room. And in the spring, we bring it out, we get our knife and we chip it. And this is called chip budding. So we, we cut the bud out, we slip it in here, we tape it up and we can grow Chardonnay. Really easy to do. And this, we used to call that field budding. Today, field budding is a very scarce commodity. There's not a lot of people that can do it effectively. In fact, I did it once. I think I had a, about a 60 to 65% take. That is not good. You normally need about a 99% take to be a good butter. So I, I decided budding was not going to be my strength. Um, right, so crazy thing happened. Winemakers started going into vineyards. Big mistake. Don't let winemakers in vineyards. They always have an opinion. So they said, dude, these four vines taste different to the other four. So they said, all right. These four vines are more pineapple-y than the rest of the vineyard. So we went ahead and we planted, and this became pineapple-y squared. And then we selected the three most pineapple-y vines, and we planted again. And this became pineapple-y cubed, like really pineapple-y. All right? Amazing. So when we graph this stuff, so if we think about... Hopefully you can get all this in. We've got warm fruit, cool fruit, so you can see me, cool fruit, high in warm fruit was like pineapple, melon, um, stone fruit, pip fruit, uh, citrus, and then grassy. Okay, warm, cool. These mass selections started getting named, high end, uh, pineapple was um, Spring Mountain, Rude, C, Wente, uh, Bado, Mount Eden, Calera. Okay, these are examples of some of these mass selections or field selections. And this was what, I never knew this. When I was drinking California Chardonnay in Australia, you know, because I went to school in Australia, because they think the New Zealanders moving to Australia increased the IQ of both countries. So it was very easy for me to get a degree in Australia. I just had to show up. So when I was drinking Chardonnay in Australia, comparing it to uh, California versus Australia, I never understood why California Chardonnay was so bloody good. 
But it wasn't until I came here that I realized we had these mass selections and field selections that have been selected over 20 years, 30 years. Cool, man. And that's why Chardonnay, pre-1990, I know it sounds boring, pre-1990, Chardonnay in California was, no wonder it became popular. It was bloody good. All right, so 1988, 89, Phylloxera came along. That's when we just, that's when we found out the bloody French had told us a bullshit story. The French had told us that AXR1 was resistant to phylloxera. It wasn't. Somebody had blended Vitis vinifera into this rootstock. So when we took these mass selections and put them on top, they were compatible. This was Vitis vinifera and this was Vitis vinifera. It was like going to family reunions to pick up chicks, right? The gene pool was relatively small. Okay, so, sorry, ambulance going by. Um, in 1988-89 though, we couldn't use this rootstock anymore because it wasn't resistant to phylloxera. So we started using Vitis blandaria and Repestris and all this other stuff. And when we took these mass selections and put them on top, unbelievable, the vines died. The yields went down, we got leaf roll. In fact, today we still talk about leaf roll one, leaf roll two, leaf roll three. Uh, which are all really bad. Uh, stem pitting and corky bark, which basically have destroyed vineyards. And they, anyway, you've got, basically got to pull them out. And uh, so the scientists said, look, we can solve this problem. And they went into the vineyard and they said, you're not going to believe it, but there's one vine here, one vine that doesn't show any virus. And that became clone one. And then the other way to do it was they took a leaf and they, this is how I got into grapes because my second degree in New Zealand is in organics and biodynamics and I got into meristem tissue culture. So this is meristem tissue culture or heat treatment. So you put a leaf on an agar plate, you cut the veins, you grow the vine, believe it or not, take the tip, grow the vine, take the tip, grow the vine. And what you're doing is you're outgrowing the virus and you put that on the new rootstock and that became clone two. Brilliant. All right. So, back, if you were to, um, I'm going to jump here because I don't want to uh, dilly-dally too long. So, this is, uh, if we were to put on here, the other two terms that we talk about are structure and texture. Texture. So, drinking, and I'm going to just quickly show you, this is made from the sea selection. And that's basically what I use. Everything that I, the darkness from the sea, the fog's edges from the sea. This has been, this has always been my favorite. See me Chardonnay for the first, you know, the thing that made, that Zelma Long used to make see me Chardonnay famous is like what, she, you know, cause she was the first non Mondavi winemaker at Mondavi as well, was the sea selection. When you put C on this chart, you get a lot of, uh, you don't get as strong a texture as what we do these days because we trick the palate a little bit with the malonectic, but you get this um, this huge bridle in uh, in terms of style. So it's massive. It's it's like a really interesting wine in terms of structure. Let me in terms of tricking the palate. If you can see my tongue here, a structural wine is a wine that comes in the mouth like this. You know, I did that with Sauvignon Blanc, right? The things that make a wine structural are acidity, the temperature you serve the wine at, wood, and carbon dioxide. Okay. The things that make a wine structural, uh, textural, are things that come in the mouth broad and finish broad. And the way we trick that is by using pH, which is different because this is a measure of hydroxyl ions. This is a measure of acidity. These are two different things. pH, uh, fruit malolactic, and uh, what else am I missing? Can't remember. Anyway, uh, oh, alcohol, and in some people's case, sugar. So these things are trying to make the wine fatter. So if you, this is the way you sort of blend wines or make wines. You, you want a combination of the two, obviously, to bring the thing back to, back to normal. If I was to put Sauvignon Blanc on here, and this is why it can never be repeated, in uh, California 
even though there is some pretty famous brand. I mean, Napa Valley should not be grown Sauvignon Blanc. I don't know who the hell drinks Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. What a waste of bloody time that is, mate. You might as well drink Chardonnay. It's just unwooded Chardonnay. That's all it is. Too high in alcohol. Right, so you need to be uh, here with New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. So um, if I would put Sauvignon Blanc on here, you're talking about this character. There is no way you can get this in Napa. It's just too damn hot. You're going to get this way more structural, uh, textural, and the only reason, the only way they can get the structural element is to pick it at lower alcohol. So, but that's not that's not fruit derived. That's just number derived. Anyway, I don't mean to be so hard on Napa. I got a lot of good friends in Napa. I do drink Napa uh, Sauvignon Blanc every now and then when I have to. Anyway, <laughs> um, right. So going back to the the problem that we had was when we had to change rootstocks and we couldn't use the mass selections anymore, we had to use clone one and clone two, which I so described. Today, there are three forms of clones. There's the Dijon clones, the UC Davis clones, and the Espaguette clones, which you may or may not have heard of. They're the ones from Italy. So those three clones are all basically that we've got. And the problem is they all taste the same because I just described to you, instead of being selected from a random field, they're now taken from one plant. That's not very random at all. And that's why today, California Chardonnay is bloody, in my mind, is pretty boring. Because by removing the virus, or whatever it was, we've also removed a lot of the flavor. So when you drink Chardonnay today, Everyone is there. I don't care if it's Dijon clone 95, 70, oh, you know, oh, the 96 is a little bit more tropical than the 75. I don't give a shit. It's all the same. It's all from the same plant. In fact, when you think about 75, 95, 70, I mean, they're not that, they, these are just plants grown in a row. So vine 75 just happened to be the vine they chose to take the cuttings from. A little bit further down the road, they had vine 95 and they took the cuttings from there. They're in the same row. They're from the same vineyard. They're not diverse at all. It's interesting, though, a couple of other, a couple of other things that you'll hear about, um, like Mount Eden. So then, then the scientists, because us winemakers start getting a little, bit, a little bit disappointed. But what they did was they took something like Mount Eden and they cleaned it up. They used that Mary's Tim tissue culture that I was talking about. And that is now called clone uh, 16. The Robert Young clone is now called clone 15. The C clone is now called clone six. So they clean these things up, but they're still clones and um, they're not as interesting. And that's why I never wanted to make Chardonnay under our own label, because I, I felt that I needed to find vineyards that were gonna be different and unique. unique. And that's, that's um, where we got to with these wines. So uh, hopefully that's why they taste different. And um, hopefully that's what you uh, you uh, see when you when you take the wines out to uh, to compare. So let's just jump back on here. Uh, any questions? Okay. <laughs> oh my God, Seth! All I can see is you. So uh, this is just a little graphic, which um, you can you can look at in your spare time when I send you the links later. The uh, so the main differences are <clears throat> the the reason why clones are chosen is for two main reasons: big yields and fast accumulator of sugar. So they want to pick they want to crop it heavy, and to crop it heavy, you have to make sure that the sugar is going to come on quickly. Because if the crop is that heavy, of course, it's going to delay maturity. So that is why these clones are selected. They're not selected for size of, of yield, looseness of cluster, the thickness of the skin, slower maturity. No, they're selected because they produce a hell of a lot of tons and they gather sugar quickly. So that's another reason why I didn't want to use clones. Hopefully that's clear. Picking Chardonnay out here in the Russian River today. The guys are sorting through it. Beautiful, uh, beautiful old vineyard. We're just wrapping up here, and should get this fruit into the vineyard at the winery in the next uh, hour or so. It'd be fantastic. This is some of the best Chardonnay that we make. And
and uh, you can see we've got big berries and small berries going in, in the same cluster and this is what mass selection uh, Chardonnay is all about. It's beautiful, beautiful fruit. A little uh, melon and, and uh, sub, subtropical characters will come from this. Fantastic. No clones here, no clones. Yes, if you were to see a clone, uh, a clone of Chardonnay should have a cluster, but I didn't take a photo next year, or next harvest I will, but basically a cluster of, of a clone is really tight. Right, the other thing I want to talk about is malolactic. So how much, this is things to upset winemakers, questions that upset winemakers. How much wood is in your wine? What is the alcohol? What, uh, what yeast do you use and how much ML is in it? Well, these are the things that are very hard to answer unless you understand all the chemistry. So the first thing uh, you need to understand is how much malic is in your wine. How much malic is in the juice? Um, you know what? I'm just going to, uh, I will do one more chart. I'm sorry to bother you, bother you but this will be the last one, I promise. Um, so what happens is if you have... If you have, um, and you guys know this because you've heard it often enough, there are a lot of acids in grapes, but the main two are tartaric and malic. In a cool climate, scary numbers. Like when we were making Chardonnay in New Zealand back in the, I always remember in 82, we had a, we had a tartaric, because we, we used to, man, we had a tartaric of 12 grams and the malic was 13. The malic acid was, was actually higher than the tartaric. I mean, unbelievable. You'd think those wines are undrinkable. Trust me. When Kim Jong Un drops a nuclear bomb and you run to the bunker, those are the ones you take. They're going to live forever. <laughs> anyway, so you have malic acid and it goes to lactic acid, right? And this is a bacteria. This is Leuconostoc onus, which is the bacteria that we use. This is not the bacteria that they use for jack in a box to make everybody sick. This is real good bacteria. This is stuff you can use. All right, if you're in a cool climate, you'll end up with, let's say you have a tartaric acid level of a total acidity of eight. Well, half of it could be malic. So four, this is not an exact science. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to make it really even easy here, but if you have four grams of malic, it's basically a half reaction. You get two grams of lactic. The rest goes into energy, which I'll explain in a minute. If you're in a warm climate, you might have one gram of malic and half a gram of lactic. So the first question, so which one is more buttery? Well, this one, this is going to be more buttery because you had more malic to start with. So instead of asking how much ML is in your wine, the first question you should ask is, are you cool climate or warm climate? Because you don't know. That immediately influences. The second big thing is, when do you add the bacteria? Because the yeast is fermenting sugar to alcohol and the yeast like nitrogen. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the three elements that we look for in the vine, and the same thing in the, in, the, in the wine as well. If you put the bacteria into the fermentation while the yeast are fermenting, the bacteria eats nitrogen quicker than the yeast, and the yeast go into stress. And so they start producing off flavors and blah, blah, blah. The interesting thing is diacetyl, which you guys have heard about being the buttery element, there's a couple of O-N elements hanging off the end of that element and the yeast can actually start eating the diacetyl as a nutrient. So if you add the bacteria during primary fermentation, the yeast eat the butter. So two questions, are you cool climate or warm climate? When did you add the bacteria? Because if you add the bacteria after harvest, after the uh, fermentation, if you add the bacteria after fermentation, you get more butter because there's no yeast to eat it. Third thing, what temperature do you ferment it at? If you ferment warm, less butter. If you ferment cold, more butter. Fourthly, um, the lees contact. You've all heard about bantonage and lees stir and all that. Right? Well, it doesn't really mean much, but basically if you leave it on the lees, you, um, you're absorbing the buttery character. So that's another, you know, if you leave it on the leaves, it absorbs the butter. If you rack it off, put the wine and remove the leaves and put the wine back into the barrel, you're preserving the buttery character. And then some of our friends, and this is legal in the US, it's not legal in other countries. You can add citric and malic acid 
because by adding more malic acid, you can make the wine more buttery. And by adding the citric, it stimulates the conversion to even more diacetyl. Complicated, I know, and we don't need to get into that. But um, there are many factors that um, determine how much ML is in your wine. So if you really want to upset a winemaker, ask him how much ML is in his wine. Because, but in reality, you need to know these five things before you ask that question. You'd actually look smarter by asking these five questions before you ask how much ML is in your wine. In terms of fermentation, uh, we're moving more and more to concrete. I think it's pretty funny. In 1982, 83, when I was making wine in New Zealand, we made we only had concrete. We never had barrels. It wasn't until I really came to California that I discovered barrels were such an important part of winemaking. I didn't even know that. But we used to get sewer pipes. You know those big sewer pipes you can buy? The Well, you guys don't buy them, but you see them on the side of the road, which they put in for housing developments and stuff. We used to get four of them. We'd drop them into a hole. We'd seal the bottom with concrete to fill it up with wine. It was great. Sewer pipes vertical in the, in the ground because you had the natural cooling of the soil and it was a cheap form of tank. Anyway, food rays we used a lot of at the time and they're coming back as well. Uh, we normally use five to six barrel barrique equivalents if you want to look at that. Punchins was, uh, that was mainly what we used in New Zealand. So punchins are 500 litre. Uh, hogsheads, sorry, let's convert to gallons. <laughs> hogsheads are 60 gallons uh, and breeks, oh, sorry, hogsheads are 100 gallons and breeks are 60 gallons. So I'm not sure why breeks were popular in the US and punchins were popular in New Zealand or Australia. Maybe because the New Zealanders and Australians were stronger and they could lift the punchin and the Americans couldn't, they had to lift the barrique. I don't know. And there's no other reason for it except the size or the, con the, the wood contact that you get. But these days, uh, for singing tree, um, singing tree and fog's edge, I'm definitely moving more uh, into the concrete realm because I like the mineral, um, the gun flint, but then with the uh, singing tree reserve, it's more traditional uh, made in brick. The other thing to remember is that wood is not really wood, wood unless you understand, like, that's another question to upset women. Do you use tight grain or loose grain wood? Allier is known as the tight grain wood. So there's Allier, Troncé, Verge, and Nevers. They're the, they're the uh, four main forests. But think about it. Allier, which is known as tight grain, and they're the most expensive barrels you buy, is a hillside. If you have a hill and you grow a tree on the hill, which side of the tree do you want your barrel from? You want it from this side, because that side is growing slower, so the grain is tighter. Does that make sense? I'm looking at you, Fred, you're the only one on my screen. So this side of the tree is tighter grain than this side of the tree. So when people come to me and go, hey Nick, we're selling Allier, I'm like, okay, I want the upside of the tree, not the downside of the tree. I don't give a shit where it's from, I just want the tightness of the grain. And then they go, forget it. So this is why, we buy barrels called Center of France. So you order, because in reality, what happens when the staves show up at the mill, the guy looks at the stave and goes, uh, oh, tight grain. That's three grains per inch, is what I call tight grain. Three grains per inch. Allier, oh, this one's a bit looser. Nevers, Vosges, Tronce. It could all be from the same tree. But because the grain is variable, they just name it these things. So also be careful about when you ask where the tightness of the grain is, because the tightness of the grain does influence the structure of the wine. Looking at the uh, the soil here, this is a close-up of the Gold Ridge, and you can go on my YouTube site to see me kicking dirt around. This is uh, obviously a cluster that similar to what we showed you, but this is really key too. We all talk about Old Vine Zinfandel. Sometimes we talk about Old Vine Cabernet Merlot, but this is Old Vine Chardonnay. Show me Chardonnay that's that old. Singing tree, are we talk about VVVV? Uh, single vineyard varietal vintage and vegan. The it's old field selection. We it's cane pruned. It's it's um, planted in 1980, so it's very old vineyard. Uh, we get the morning sun, which is really important. The second key factor for me is the the, the sandy loam. There is uh, it's all hand harvested, whole cluster press, and we've got really cool neighbours. Um, mainly uh, Dan Goldfield is the big player out here. Dutton Goldfield, you've probably heard of them. Uh, so he, Dan Goldfield himself, he uh, he um, buys fruit from all around the region. Obviously, I used to work at Gary Farrell, so I'm, we, we get fruit from down there too. 
Singing Tree First Vintage was 2013. We really launched it. Um, Mark Bishop is on here, but mainly it was launched in Texas, was which was uh, we, we really got us started. And uh, I mean, as much Cabernet as we make at Goldschmidt Vineyards, I mean, we're probably 70% Cab. Chardonnay is probably what uh, what got me started. And I still love drinking Chardonnay. I drink a lot of Chardonnay. But uh, anyway. You're in the road. The, uh, I, I want to make sure I keep bottling these wines before harvest because I want to keep them really fresh. As I said, I'm decreasing the amount of barrel. The 2018 has about 30% concrete. The 2019 is about 50% concrete. My goal is to switch this to uh, 30, 70 rather than 70, 30. Uh, we are limiting the amount of ML. The quick answer to the question is we're about 25, 30% malolactic in any particular year. What we do is we allow the bacteria to start and then we run through uh, this time of the year, about March, and then we, um, we add SO2 because I want to add SO2 about two months before I pump the wine out. So this wine today is, uh, sorry, in April we're adding the SO2. This wine today is totally oxidized. So um, if you were to look at the wine, this is a lot like when I talk about color instability with red wine. You know, we talk about crusty stuff on the side of the bottle. This is the same thing with Chardonnay. With Chardonnay, the more oxidized, oxygen's like a drug. You know, the, the, more, the more the wine, um, uh, the more the juice sucks the oxygen, the more stable it becomes. It can absorb and absorb and absorb and, and, and eventually it's saturated and it drops out with the leaves. And even though we haven't added any SO2, so this is uh, October, November, December, January, February, March. Okay, so we've had seven months. I have not protected that Chardonnay. And today, the Chardonnay is crystal, you know, that light straw. I learned this because with Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand, we used to use extreme reduction. We used to add sodium erythorbate and SO2 to the juice. Sodium erythorbate is an antioxidant. You might know it as ascorbic acid. When you drink those wines today, they're green. They're like embalmed. They never aged. What I want to do is, is make Chardonnay so stable that when you drink this wine 20 years from now, it's still the right color. It doesn't go brown. So uh, that's the goal, is to try and make Chardonnay really, really stable. And if you can get the color really, really stable, the flavors will be really, really stable. So that's why we use very little amounts of SO2. We're trying to emphasize the mineral characters. We can talk about CO2, but we don't need to. Um, just keep the wines really bright and straightforward. Here in the Russian River. Well, this is not really the vineyard. This is an apple tree. But this is what was planted here before we planted grapes. And that's what's unique about the Russian River is these old soils. This is an old gold rich sandy loam. And so it was planted in 1984. This vineyard has never been replanted. And we are very close to maturity. What's unique about the vineyard is we have this soil that the phylloxera can't live in. And so these vines were planted in 1984 and they're still here today. And these are old mass selections. These are not Dijon clones or UC Davis clones that give you sort of that white peach pit fruit. These are wines that give you more mineral and graphite and great structure and finesse. And they have big berries and small berries in the same cluster. I don't know if you can see that here. Quite clearly there, there's some small berries and we're very close to harvest. As you can see, I dropped the berry. The, these are, wines are going to give you sort of more melon, a little bit more subtropical, but the graphite character is very hard to reproduce and there's only from soils like this. Anyway, still on AXO1. I think this is one of the funniest photos I've taken in a vineyard. <laughs> I'm jumping over to the Dutton, Dutton Reserve Chardonnay, but I really wanted to show you this. Check this out. That's moss. That moss is growing on the arm of the vine. Is that hilarious? That's how damn cold this vineyard is. And that's what makes this Green Valley region where we make the Dutton from so, so unique. Again, super old vineyard. Again, old vine Chardonnay. And uh, I just think it's hilarious. Not a lot of people get it, but I think it's funny. That's Nick Goldschmidt humor.
Um, so we're in the Green Valley. I'm just shoving all this on one slide this time instead of two. It's the coolest plant. It's uh, not quite as old as um, the, the singing tree vineyard, but it's still fairly old. We do the same process, but we do increase the amount of barrels. So if somebody wants something a little bit fuller and richer, then, uh, then the, the reserve Chardonnay is for you. The Dutton, there is a rule with the using the Dutton name, though it can't retail for under 35 bucks. Although uh, who knows what's going on out there with the uh, changing conditions. I'm sure there's some different prices going on out there with some of the other Dutton wines. Uh, so the singing tree Dutton is a little bit fuller versus the mineralness of the singing tree. So the singing tree is a little bit more mineral, whereas the, the Dutton's a little fuller. We don't add any press wine. Press wine gives you a little bit more astringency. So really looking for fleshy and roundness. And uh, we, we, we make less than a thousand cases basically. So uh, that's a photo of the vineyard that we just looked at. What's not to love about these old Chardonnay vineyards? So, so rare, but out here in the Russian River, Green Valley, this is the Singing Tree Reserve Chardonnay from the Dutton Ranch. And this is dry farmed. You can see there's no irrigation there at all. Sicano is what we call it in Spanish. And it's on AXR1 rootstock, which is amazing. And it's on that rootstock, which is no longer resistant to phylloxera, but it's on this gold ridge sandy loam. You can see how powdery the soil is. Can you see that? There you go. And uh, so the phylloxera can't live in it. And we've got these old, old vines planted in 1974 and really unique clusters because these are old mass selections or field selections there's big berries and small berries in the same cluster and look at this beautiful canopy this is old california style chardonnay so lucky to be able to make wine from here and it's so uniquely different you just get all this graphite and mineral and Man, it's just unctuous when you drink it. I love it. Anyway, Dutton Chardonnay, Singing Tree Reserve, dry farmed, Goldridge Sandy Loam, out here in the Russian River. Beautiful. So just looking at the two wines um, in terms of processing, as I said, the Singing Tree is brighter and more vibrant, a little bit more mouth-watering, sto wet stone characters, and then Obviously over here, we're a bit fuller and richer uh, with a touch more wood. So just wrapping up, we talked about Boulder Bank and Forefathers Sauvignon Blancs. Those were the 2019s. We are fermenting right now. The fermentations for 2020 are underway. We talked about the Singing Tree uh, 18 and the Dutton 17, obviously with the Fog's Edge as well. Uh, as I said, single vineyard, varietal vineyard, vegan. These are real as a as I always say, these are these are real places, real stories, and any time that you get to come and visit me, I know that you guys are super busy. We hope you guys are super busy in the OND, but that's also the really good time to come visit me. If you want to come out and, and look around the vineyards for a morning or an afternoon, just give me a call. Come on up. I'd love to host you. People drive around with me all the time. Um, I've been working in New Zealand since 1982, and obviously with Chardonnay in California since 1990, so I have a little bit of history. Uh, I thought it was interesting that the wine enthusiast came out with that article that said the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. I'm still waiting for them to come out with the 50 best winemakers over 50. <laughs> we'll see. But when Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb and runs to the bunker, I'm not going to take the wines that are made by the 40-year-olds because I want wines that are going to live. I want people that have been making wines from the same vineyard for 20 years. Those guys haven't even made wines for 20 years. Anyway, just my little joke. Um, Boulder Bank, Neighbours of Cloudy Bay, Alan Scott, Stonely Matua. Uh, forefathers, neighbours, uh, Dog Point and Grey Whack. Uh, these, both of these guys are actually the ex-winemakers of Cloudy Bay and they're very close personal friends of mine. Singing Trees, Kokomo. You, some of you guys haven't heard of Kokomo, but it's a very um, cultish wine out here in the Russian River. William Sell and Costa Brown are obviously down in the south there. And then in terms of Dutton, Ramey's the big player, as you know, with Dutton. But he, Dave Ramey has purchased a big vineyard on Westside Road. And so his Dutton wines will gradually, I'm not sure, I spoke to Dave a year or so ago, but he's gradually going to decrease what he makes at a Dutton and move more to this amazing vineyard that he purchased um, where he's invested most of his money up on Westside Road. As I said, uh, I welcome any opportunity to, to talk to your clients, especially during this downturn, if they've got a little bit of time on their hands and we can make special videos and special presentations just for them, which is what I do all week when I'm not talking to you guys. And again, these are my contacts. Um, 
please follow me and uh, I welcome any uh, feedback, any suggestions, and I'm going to stop sharing this now, but I will stay online uh, for questions and uh, I will uh, come off record here and, and send you guys the link in case you want to um, see this for the future. So I really, man, it's difficult out there, it's tough out there, but I so, so appreciate you guys uh, hanging with me this morning and, and hearing a little bit about what we're trying to do with white wine style out here in Sonoma County. Thank you. Same, Nick. Sorry, we, Susan, I'm just going to. Uh, we need to add a D in that goldschmidtvineyards.com slide. Oh, sorry. I knew you'd spot, I knew you'd spot that. <laughs>